Hi guys and welcome to a new series of Learn Electronics Repair videos. In this series we're going to be looking at hints, tips and techniques involved in GPU repair. I came up with the idea of this series of videos from some comments that were posted in a recent uh, video I published uh, with this little graphics card. And from the comments there, I thought, you know, this is a good idea to look at various aspects of GPU repair. So in this first one, we're going to have a look at the little capacitors across the PCIe connector, which you find on all graphics cards, and what part they play in the function of the GPU, and in which ways they can go wrong and stop it from functioning. Okay, so let's get stuck in and let's have a look. So this is an old graphics card that I was looking at uh, just from the aspect of can we repair it and can we learn anything that's useful to us because these techniques repairing graphics cards are the same regardless of whether it was talking about something pretty pointless to repair like this or whether it's the latest RTX series graphics cards or the latest AMD cards. And I have here, as you saw the introduction, I have three other graphics cards which I'm going to use during this video. So the thing with this one, it powers up, all the voltages are present, all the resistances check OK, but it just doesn't detect. And it doesn't actually read the BIOS chip. It never accesses the BIOS. The clock's running, the reset comes off the GPU, it just doesn't work. And I have this on one side, I have a little pole going, which I also went from this video, which opened for a few more weeks. It's we're going to remove the GPU and try to reboil it. And the poll was, what level of equipment would you like me see to do, to use to do that? Okay, and I'll, I'll link that so you can, you can vote. But during the uh, upload of that video, somebody, uh, two people with very very bright eyes in the comments said, uh, "Hey Richard, you do know you've got two broken resistors, two broken capacitors down here. C7 is broken, and also C14." And they're right, they are broken. I'll just put it under the microscope and you can see that. Here are our broken capacitors. Uh, one of them is here, C7, and it's completely missing, as you can see. And the other one here, C14, is completely missing. And the rest seem to be present. Um, so what do these capacitors actually do? Well, you can see they come from the PCIe. And you'll see pairs of tracks go into pairs of capacitors and then continuing on into the GPU. And these pairs of tracks are actually the PCIe lanes. And we'll find on here, if we count the pairs, we have 16. So we, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And you can see clearly there are 16 there. And if I turn the board over on the other side, you will see a similar arrangement. So again, we have pairs of tracks going under the GPU. And here, once again, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to where it says V2, yeah, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And these don't have any capacity, as you can see. These are just test points, and they disappear under the GPU. So the capacitors are only on the other side of the board. To understand what these are, what they do, all these uh, pairs of tracks that go to the GPU on both sides, we need to have a look at the pinout for the PCIe connector. This is the pinout for the PCIe connector, 16 lanes. And um, you can see here it says key. So this is where the slot is in the PCIe fingers. So you can obviously only put the card in one way around. Now on the short section of the connector, you'll see we have, this is the component side and this is the rear side of the board. On the component side, the first three fingers are 12 volts. Then we have a ground. Then we have two connections called SM clock and SM data. This is the SM buzz. This is a serial data communication bus connecting to the device and the slot. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we then have um, three volts. We have a wake signal going out, it shows it here as a wake signal. And we have one called JTAG. Okay. On the other side, we have present, this one. 
okay we have two more 12 volts we have some again more jtag we have another three two more three volts and a power good which says here pcie reset so the signals that are marked jtag these jtag this stands for joint test action group and these effectively form an industry standard interface for connecting test equipment to, to devices. For instance, to reprogram the firmware or to run tests. So that's what the JTAG is. And we can actually ignore that. The power guard, this comes from the PCI reset. So effectively, before the CPU starts up, when you start the machine up, this is held low. And this only goes high once the reset comes off the CPU and it can start executing. At this point, the reset comes off the GPU that's connected here, and that can also start executing code. You'll also see we have this pin here, present one. This basically is to detect that it's a card inserted. So this has got present one hash, that means it's active low. So basically, when you plug the card in, there's a track on the board that just connects ground to here. And that's one of the ways it actually knows that a card is connected. The wake signal, this is involved in suspend states on um, computers where you can actually put it into suspend and then wake it back up again. Now, after the key slot, this is fairly simple if you look at it. Although there's lots and lots of connections it's just repeating the same pattern over again. The easiest way to explain all these connections is to draw it out on a piece of paper. We have down this side a whole load of transmit lines and they actually marked TS, TXP and TXN, positive and negative zero, positive and negative one, and so on down to 15. And the same on this side. The connections on this side, we'll just look at the first two first this is to explain how it works these signals are communicating between the motherboard and whatever's plugged into the slot in our case a gpu and the gpu uses these signals to receive all the data uh, for its 3d graphics which it needs to produce and also to communicate with the computer to tell the computer what parameters it has what make what model how much memory and so on um, each of these connections effectively is what we call PCIe lane. And in one lane, we actually have four connections. So these two here and these two here are lane zero. Okay? There you go. Now, each of these lanes is known as an LVDS or low voltage differential signal. And I'll just explain to you about LVDS, what it is, and why we use it. Um, you may think, okay, we want to send some data to a graphics card. So we can send that as serial data, which is just a series, if you like, of ones and zeros. One being represented by a voltage, and zero being represented by the lack of voltage. We can do that, but it's not a very efficient way of communicating with the graphics card in this case and it's also prone to a number of problems the first problem is that switching this on and off effectively the amount of time it takes to do that will depend on the voltage of the pulse so if these if these are five volts high from zero volts it takes a finite amount of time to switch a MOSFET or similar device on and off to switch this voltage. And the higher the voltage, the longer it takes to do it. And when we get to very, very high data rates, that matters. So to make this efficient and to give us a high enough data rate, we'd have to use a very low voltage pulse. Say 0.9 volts, 1 volt. Yeah. Now, when we make the pulses smaller, we introduced another problem, and that's interference. So if these lines are long, relatively long, the tracks, and there's lots of them together, we can get a kind of a crosstalk between adjacent tracks, act like capacitors, and we get induced signals from one to another, and similar with other tracks on the PCB running around it. And what you may find, an actual fact, that your zero volts isn't a flat zero volts, 
which are kind of like a something like this okay hovering around zero going maybe even positive and negative and when we put our pulses on here the small ones effectively we kind of get this sort of effect yeah we can get this sort of effect where the pulses are there but they're kind of wandering around in voltage and the signal when it gets to the other end it becomes corrupted where is zero what is the zero it's moving around it's not staying stable i'll take a fresh piece of paper because i've got a bit more space on this one so with the lvds how we get around this problem we have the logic signal coming in this is ones and zeros pulses okay and this goes into an ic integrated circuit which is a transmitter tx is the common abbreviation for transmitter in the electronics and there's two signals coming out of here the one that has the little dot is an inverse of the other one it's upside down so it sends the same series of pulses but one lot of them are upside down compared to the other one and this goes down the tracks the the way down these eh? and it comes to on the other side a receiver chip and the receiver chip has an inverted input here which converts the upside down half back to the right way up again okay and coming out of here is your logic in fact where your pulses your ones and zeros on the lvds what you actually have is this you have two wires okay and effectively this this is if you like you, you reference your naught volts well, there's probably actually a reference of halfway between the two voltages, about 0.45 of a volt. And you will have on this, on one of the wires, this one, the one that isn't inverted, you'll have your pulses, okay? Like so. And on the other one, which is inverted, you'll have the same pulses in the same places, but upside down, okay? So basically now, this represents your data and it represents the data in a different way when the two voltage levels are different that gives you a logic one yeah? when the two voltage levels are the same that gives you a logic zero and this is why it's called a differential signal it's also called lv low voltage because we can do this with very low voltages so what happens now if we've got some sort of interference in our line We've still got a situation where we've got pulses that effectively are close together, zeros, yeah, and spaces where they were wide apart, yeah. It doesn't matter that the voltage level is varying because we still have the same situation and the data therefore isn't corrupted. And that's why we use LVDS for high data rate transmissions. Not only on PCIe, by the way, uh, USB works the same way, uh, HDMI cables work the same way, and lots of other applications where we actually use LVDS. I'm sure it's clear from this description that a PCIe lane or an LVDS connection only transmits data in one direction. So to make a complete lane bidirectional, on the other side, we have to have the same setup so exactly same as we had before we have another one of these like so so this one is sending data from the motherboard to the device and these ones are sending data from the device to the motherboard another question you may have is why do we only have capacitors on one side of the motherboard when we have receive and transmit LVDS lanes on both sides. And the reason is that that isn't the case. These capacitors you see here are not the capacitors on our graphics card. These capacitors, and if I just get the microscope and show you, are actually on the motherboard. These are the actual capacitors that you can see on that diagram. Because the diagram is of a PCI slot and the capacitors it shows are actually on the motherboard. So the capacitors on our graphics card are actually on this side. They're in each of these connections. That's our capacitors.
So effectively, there are capacitors on both the transmit and the receive lines, exactly the same. There's one setter on the motherboard and one setter on the card that you've put into the PCIe slot. So that's what that is. Talked plenty enough about that. But I'm sure you understand it now. Um, we then have three more of them. So those four together effectively make four lanes. So this is like an X1 PCIe. That's all together X4. We have four more, which makes X8. And we have eight more, which makes X16. So actually different types of cards you can get. One times, four times, eight times, 16 times. And you'll notice in each section, as well as having the transmit lines, there's also a present signal here. You see presence to hash, present to hash, yeah? So this effectively is telling you if you've got in here a single lane device, a four lane device, there's another one here if you've got an eight lane device and another one here if you've got 16. And all that happens that these just connect to ground. There's no signal on them. It's just the pins connected to ground. So when you push the card in, it grounds this point. That's how it knows a card's inserted and how many lanes a card has. It's a very simple method. On the other side, if you look, we have a very similar arrangement, but if you count here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah? We have another four, that's 12. We have one, two, three, four. That's your 16 lanes, but if you notice, we have one more differential signal coming here. And this is ref clock or reference clock. This is a signal into the GPU. And this reference clock is essential for the data transmission. It uses a clock effectively to know when to expect it on any one lane, either to have a differential signal or a same signal. So that's what the clock's for. Now, which of these connections does our GPU actually need to be detected if currency miners have given anything useful to the world whatsoever, then it's the fact that we know from devices like this, mining adapters, what signals a GPU actually needs to work. We know that a GPU can work in 16 lane mode or in single lane mode, and possibly in the others as well. But we know certainly it can work in single lane because of these. Coming in here is the 12 volts. And on this adapter, we have another connector and Molex. We have a couple of these. And we can use all of them if we wish, or whichever one we can easily use from our power supply. After the 12 volts, we have a little book converter, which you can see here. And this drops the 12 volts down. I think it's the 5 volts on this card. And then after that, we actually have here a voltage regulator. You can see it's marked AMS 1084CM 3.3. This is a 3.3 volt regulator, and this generates the 3.3 volts going into the card. So we know from the diagram we just looked at, the first three here are 12 volts, and there's a couple more to the other side, and the fourth one up here is 3.3, which comes from this, and there's a couple more on the other side. The only other signals coming into our adapter is the USB. The USB cable on our mining adapter, this blue one, is USB 3. So we have, if we have a look inside the connector, um, you'll see first of all, on this front end, there are four pins in there. This is your standard USB one. So you've got ground and power, and then you've got effectively a differential, an LVDS pair, a data plus and data minus. Now if you look further back into it, if I just get the angle, further back there are five more pins now, these are USB 3 connections. So on these five pins, you have two more LVDS pairs, data plus or minus. So in total, on our USB 3 cable, we have three lanes, if we want to use the same terminology as the PCIe. We have three lanes of data. So you can look at our board now, and you can see down here a pair of connections in the middle another pair and then there a third pair so that's your three lanes of data one pair goes across over here you can see it goes over here uh, another pair you can see goes to here and the third pair is a little bit further over also goes to here a little bit further up so those are the actual connections on the cable coming to here so you've got six 
connections. So we can have a look now with our test meter and let's see where they actually go to. Here we have the part of the adapter that fits into the PC. And if we have a look on this side again, you can actually see here, I've just got the light to catch on it, your pair of lines. So these are the one pair of data lines. I'll just put it under here so I can easily get nice and flat. So we can get onto one of these two. And if we just get the board, it just moves across a bit where you can actually see it. And again, I'll just get onto these. So I'm on, I'm on the first one. Okay. And I can go over to the socket here. And let's have a look to see where they actually go. Okay. And they're going to go up here somewhere. Yes. Yeah. There. Okay. That's the first one. And the next one, the fourth one. We'll go to the other pin of these pins. So that's the, that's the fourth one. Okay, that's the fourth one. And on the other side of the connector, if you do the same thing, you'll see there's two more lanes. One, two here. And one, two there. Yeah, you can see them. So once again, we can do the same thing. So this, this is one of the lanes. It's a bit difficult to get this thing to sit flat, actually, to do this. In fact, it's very difficult to get the set flat. But I can tell you, that if we track those out, we'll find they come to pins two and three here, and the other ones a little bit further down here. Okay, you can see there and there. So if we refer again now to our diagram, we can actually see where these connections actually are. The first signal actually is this one. This is the ref clock, the reference clock, plus and minus. So this is a 100 megahertz clock signal, and this is generated by the PC, sent to the PCIe slot to communicate with the inserted card. And the PC and the inserted card use this signal to synchronize all the communication between the two. So this is essential before any communication can occur. The second signal we see is this one. This is the first receive line. So this is where it says RXN, this is received by the device in the slot. So this is where the computer sends the request. When it wants to know the parameters of the, of the graphics card. You know, how much RAM does it have, what chipset is it, how many CUDA calls and all the other things it might want to tell it. So that's where the request is sent in. The card then replies on the other two wires of the same PCIe lane, which is these two. So this is where the, the response actually comes back out. And this is where it goes into the computer and then obviously the computer, the BIOS, which is effectively running at the moment, can do what it needs to do to set everything up ready for this device. So all these three pairs, these six connections, must be functional for the graphics card to ever be able to respond to the PC and for the PC to detect it. We also know then that, that this signal, this SM bus data, is not required. This is not used in that process. We know the JTAG is not used in that process. The wake signal is involved with suspend and sleep states that that the PC can get into, so that is not part of the detection process. And that just brings us down to this one, this PCIe reset. Now, this signal is held low when you first switch the motherboard on until we reach the point where the PCH, the North Bridge as it was called, is ready to start the CPU. So it removes the reset from the CPU so the CPU can start to execute the first code from the BIOS and at the same time or very shortly before or afterwards it removes this, this signal goes high which then allows the GPU to start functioning and waiting for a request. We know that there are three pairs, six wires in our USB 3 cable. So you might wonder well how does the reset work? surely the PC needs to be able to enable this high. And yes, technically that is correct. This is the pin 11, which is the reset pin. And if I connect to that and then just uh, press the power, 
you'll see straight away it just goes to 3.3 that from what i can see on this, this adapter is connecting through a resistor somewhere to this to this there the 3.3 and that's all it is it doesn't directly go to it I've, I've measured these but it's going to there through a resistor somewhere so from what i can assume with this is the 3.3 is always high on the mining adapter it's never where once you apply power why does our mining adapter have a pci reset line active low which can never be low it can only ever be high because it appears to be attached to the 3.3 volts through resistor on the mining adapter it can't possibly be signaled from the computer to go from low to high to remove the reset when the cpu is ready to start executing and talk to the pcie slots because there's no connection there to implement that and the only answer that i can think of is to this question is they did it to cut corners and to cut costs so they obviously felt that they didn't need to implement the pcie reset and let's have a look at why they might have thought that's the case and why that may well be the case so we have our gpu and the gpu requires various power supplies so you have a, a, a v core which is about 0 0.9 volts in a lot of cases it will vary from one to another we have voltage for the memory control vmc we'll call it which will be the same voltage as your memory depending if it's ddr5 or whatever let's say it's 1.35 volts you'll also have a pex supply which powers the interface between the gpu and the pci express 0.9 volts mostly and we will also have another supply which will be the same voltage as the ROM uh, typically 3.3 volts sometimes 1.8 volts so we have all these supplies going to the GPU and the GPU can't start to execute its, its program or to work it can't start working until all the voltages are present so we have coming in here also reset okay and that reset comes from an AND gate, a logical AND gate. Now, an AND gate basically has two or more inputs, but it only ever has one output. And the output is high. That means it's got a voltage on, typically 3.3 .3 volts on graphics cards, but it could be 5, it could be 1.8. But that will be high when both inputs are high. One of these inputs comes from PCI... E reset platform reset it's sometimes called PLT RST that's the reset signal we're looking at on our adapter the other input comes from one of the power goods on here so typically the voltages will come on in a certain order so you'll effectively have a controller generating the 1.8 okay and this has coming out of it a signal called P good power good which goes into the controller which generates the PEX. Yeah? And when that switch is on, that has a P good which comes out and goes into the controller which generates the voltage for the memory controller. And when that switch is on, that has a power good, yeah, and that goes into the controller that generates the 0.9 volts. All the voltages are now present. And the last VRM controller has a power good, which maybe not directly, but comes back to here. Okay. So as each power good goes high, the next supply switches on. And after the last supply is running, the power good comes back to the gate. The gate needs both these signals to be high to switch on. So until this power good arrives, this will be low and this can't start. And I think that's what they're doing here. On our board, this is always high. Yeah, this one is never low. It's always high and they're relying on that power good to enable the GPU to remove the reset this resets active low we put a line over it or we can put a hash in front of it or a star all these things mean it's active low and that only comes off and goes high when the last power goes high and i think that's what they're doing and they're relying on that sequence to take the reset off the gpu at the correct time not the reset coming from the pc and that should work but i think it's possible in some cases that it might not work whereby 
the GPU is being switched on at the wrong time, maybe not enough delay. Uh, the reason I think that might be the case, this is only my kind of supposition. I have seen on an odd occasion a graphics card that will not work in a single lane adapter. And my guess is that's one possible reason, but it's only one possible reason, yeah? If you know more about that, please get some comments below, down here, yeah? Let me know, because I'm, it's a kind of a, I kind of know, but I'd, I'd be interested to know more. It may actually be that some graphics cards don't implement that final power good in the same way where the AND gate to rely on the reset coming off from the PC to start the GPU. That's, that's a possibility. Uh, I'm also sorry if I'm like worrying you because I'm jumping from one side of the screen to the other in the little inset. That's because I have a nasty habit of drawing on my paper underneath the inset where you can't see it. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the initial discussion. What can we work out about these capacitors and the PCIe interface? Well, there's a few things we can figure out. And the first one is a very important one. This is our little mining adapter, and it's absolutely essential you put these in the motherboard the right way round. And it's quite likely if you've picked up a board for spares or repair from somewhere, famous auction site, <laughs> that you've picked up a board that's been connected to a mining adapter the wrong way round. And that is not going to be a repairable graphics card, and I'll show you why. And I'll show you one other thing. You notice a short finger here. This is the one that's grounded when you insert the card so that the computer knows it's in. And the reason it's shorter is so that all these connections are made before that one. So that when that one is made and grounded that pin, it's definitely in, yeah? That's why we have that and we have the same here. Exactly the same reason. So what happens if we plug our mining adapter in the wrong way around and why is it so fatal for our graphics cards? From this diagram, we can actually now work out why that is a major, major problem. We can see that we need these two lines here connected. We need these two lines here connected and these two. Now, on the little diagram I drew, you might wonder where are those receiver and transmitter chips either side of the LVDS connection? Well, the ones on the computer are actually in the PCH chip itself in the in the chipset in the PCH that's where they are and the other side the one here the receiver and the transmitters any mech out they are in the GPU so if these transceivers transmitters and receivers get damaged then you can't just change them unless you change the GPU or, or the chipset and obviously changing the GPU often you just can't get one or it's too expensive or you don't have the equipment to change it. It's not the sort of repair that most people can undertake. So damaging these is a very, very bad thing to do. Now let's have a look what happens when we plug our mining adapter in the wrong way round. So effectively when it's in upside down, this pin becomes connected to here and pins two and three after the slot get connected to here. You can see that pin two is three volts. So straight away, you've got three volts coming into one of your ref clock inputs there, okay? And let's have a look what's happened on the other side. So on the other side, it's upside down again. And we have this lane coming in. Now, on this lane coming in, we have pins three and four. So Back to front and here, yeah? One, two, three, and four, and there's three. And that's also going to VCC. This line does not have any capacitors on the graphics card. This one and all the other receiver lines do have. So yes, when you invert it, this line, pins one, two, three, four, pins five and six end up stuck in here. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, five is actually going to ground and six is going to the SM DAT signal, which isn't actually got a voltage on it. So in that in itself wouldn't damage this lane. And even if one was going to one of the power rails, it wouldn't actually matter because the capacitors here will block the DC. 
from that you can see very clearly that by inserting that adapter the wrong way around instantly we're going to send three volts into here and three volts into here and that for a GPU <laughs> to use an ultra race they don't like it up them yet <laughs> they don't like it up them they do not like and they do not appreciate three volts coming here and instantly you will destroy the receiver here on this side and the receiver here on this side if we have a graphics card that has all the voltages present everything seems to be okay the resistances are okay but it just doesn't detect one of the first important things to test is this these fingers these lanes especially the first ones if you suspect it might have been plugged in the wrong way on a mining adapter but to be quite honest the amount of time it takes you know you might as well change them all when I mean, if you don't have enough patience to do this you shouldn't be repairing the electronics and we do this with the meter in diode mode so we can have a look and we can see i'm on the first pair here and you can see where the pairs are you don't even need to look them up you can see where the wires go yeah so all these should read the same as each other okay another thing worth checking especially on the first lane the one where we might have had this reversal damage is to make sure that the two are not shorted to each other and they shouldn't be you can check all the rest as well but that isn't quite so important but yes you can go down here and you can check to make sure that none of them are actually shorted to each other now on the other side pins two and three this is the ref clock these go directly to the gpu all the rest go via these capacitors so on this side the first two you will see have a resistance and it may well be different from the other side and again they shouldn't be sorted shorted to each other all the other ones should read open circuit if they don't read open circuit then you've got a short circuit capacitor so you can just take the time just going down here just checking them and looking to see if any short circuit capacitors the other pins in between the lanes are actually ground pins so if you slip you will get a continuity to ground which you may have just heard a couple of times while i was just making those checks um so to test the lanes into the gpu to test the gpu from this side you need to go to this side of the capacitor or the test points which are here because of the capacitors protecting this set of lanes from the outside world it's less likely to find a problem here but it might sometimes find you a faulty gpu so it's worth checking because it doesn't take very long so we can just have a look on here yeah and you can see these are reading quite different yeah 0.5.6 531 and again i can't say exactly what they should read because it'll vary from one card to another but what you can say is they should all read the same as each other these test points are a bit dirty on this one does not help you at all so it's probably easy just go to go, go to the, yeah it's easy to go to the capacitor on this board so we'll just go along here and see if i can see any different ones So we can see they all read the same or very similar. I'm not, I'm not saying you should look for small differences, but if you find one that reads open or short or is greatly different from all the others, then you've got a problem with the GPU. The question now then is, what value are these capacitors? And are they the same on all cards? Are they all the same? Because they all have PCIe, so it's the same interface. So are they actually the same on all? And we can't prove they're the same on all, but what we can do is first of all measure some of the capacitors and then we have a few more cards so i have this old card i have uh, an amd r9380x and i have a, an rtx 3080 and a gtx 970 here so i have a few we can try and if they all read the same i think we can pretty much assume that they are all the same so what value are these capacitors well on this card and we can measure these in circuit by the way because one end actually just goes to the finger so it's open circuit so we can get a good reading so on this card we can just measure a few so it is one of them and it's reading 
91 uh, nanofarads. What's the other one really? 89. Let's read a few of them. They seem to be reading about 90. 93.7. So I think these are probably 100 nanofarads. I mean, those are not standard uh, values that I'm reading. 95. Yeah. So I think we can say probably these are actually 100 nanofarad capacitors because that is a standard value. 90 is not a standard value. Either that or there's something special about them. Just go across them. No, that one's reading 100, just to show the point. Okay. So I think we can say the 100 nanofarads on this card. Let's have a look at some of the others to see. Are they always the same? So this is the R9390X. We can see it has the same setup. Sorry the light doesn't stay on the meter very long, unfortunately. Uh, but let's just check one. See what we have. Well, these are higher, so they're not always the same. That's the first thing we can say. These read 200. That one reads 200. Yeah. More like 2.2. Uh, so these are like... Uh, 2.2, yeah. 220, that one's reached 300. So they're not all the same, that's for sure, but they're all kind of like close. I might have been across two at the same time, and I got 300. Yeah, it was, yeah. The 220 nanofarads on that one. So I'm like, this is the uh, GTX uh, 970. What do they read on this one? Two hundred on this one. So it looks like apart from that old card, they're all two hundreds or two twenties. Uh, we've got one more. This is the uh, RTX thirty eighty. Oh, let's have a look at this one. Uh, it's slightly out of focus, I think, because it's higher than the other ones, but we can read them. So here's some here. Two hundred. So it would appear that the 200 nanofarad on all these fairly recent or, or you know, not so recent cards and the 100 on this, uh, which I would call it a vintage card. Um, so, yeah, they're not always the same, we know that, but they should all be the same as each other. So the question is now, with this card, if I replace these two capacitors, C7 and C14, which the eagle-eyed subscriber spotted, Will this work? I've soldered R7 back in it. It's slightly crooked, but we can test it. It's good. So we can test from this end to the finger. And we can measure the resistance, sorry, from diode mode, not resistance. We can go in diode mode from here to ground and here to ground. If they read the same, we know it's connecting to the GPU. So that one's done. Um, this one actually came off while I was working on the board. Uh, but this is the other one, C14. You can see what's happened here. In actual fact, the pad was broken off as well. So what I'm going to do with this one is I can solder, obviously, one end of the capacitor to here. And I'm just cleaning off the corrosion from the test point here. And I'm, once I've soldered this end of the capacitor down, I'm going to take uh, a little thin bit of wire from here to the other end of the capacitor and therefore make the connection. That's ready. Just the one was a little bit fiddly with the broken pad. But we just uh, get a test meter so we can just be sure for this. So these are the resistors, the ends that go to the GPU. And we can see that one's reading 502. And I'll try and get on the capacitor itself. 501. So that's connecting okay, that end. And then the other end, uh, we can just check from the actual component itself. If I just actually get onto the capacitor here and down to the finger. Yeah, we have a good connection. And then the other one looks a little bit messy, but it's done. It's just fine. It's there, okay. I could have probably made a slightly tidier job of that, or a much tidier job of that, but uh, it is done. And if you, anything, you say the track is the same way as the track was, <laughs> if time is even involved in this. Uh, so we can say that from here, this end of the capacitor I just get onto, is, and we can go to the finger. 
and we have a connection. And then from this end, where well, I've made this a little bit of a mess, I'll just use the microscope, it's much easier for me than watching the screen. So from the capacitor, we have a connection to there, that's good. And then to ground. Yeah, I think we're reading 501. That's ready. Just the one was a little bit fiddly with the broken pad. But we just uh, get a test meter so we can just be sure for this. So these are the resistors, the ends that go to the GPU. And we can see that one's reading 502. And I'll try to get on the capacitor itself. 501. So that's connecting, okay, that end. And then the other end, uh, we can just check from the actual uh, component itself. If I just actually get onto the capacitor here and down to the finger. Yeah, we have a good connection. And then the other one looks a little bit messy, but it's done. It's just fine. It's there, okay. I could have probably made a slightly tidier job of that or a much tidier job of that, but uh, it is done. And if you, anything, you say the track is the same way as the track was, <laughs> if time is even involved in this. Uh, so we can say that from here, this end of the capacitor I just get onto is, and we can go to the finger. And we have a connection. And then from this end, where well, I've made this a little bit of a mess, I'll just use the microscope. It's much easier for me than watching the screen. So from the capacitor, we have a connection to there. That's good. And then to ground. Yeah, I think we're reading 501. So we can test this now. Here's our GPU ready to go. So I'll just switch the uh, monitor on and select VGA. We'll switch it on and let's see what it actually does. Well, it's booting up. We get one bleep. I get a blue light on the monitor. Ah, and, guys, believe it or not, it's actually working. Hey. And there we have it. So it's running, computer's on, and you can see that we have on the screen there. We have the onboard video and we have the ATI Radeon 3450. Okay, so it's it's working. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, I have a few ideas for a few similar ones. I mean, the idea is with this series is to look at one specific area of GPU repair in detail, whether it's, in this case, discussing parts of the hardware interface or whether it's looking at test software various aspects okay and i'll see you all soon on another learn electronics repair video ciao for now guys